tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to bonus episode number nine. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing two stories for you about paranormal perceptions and diabolical doorways. Both of them plumbed from the depths of my extensive audio archive. I sincerely hope you enjoy them and that you'll join me each and every Wednesday for more terrifying tales from my creep-filled crypt. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy even more tales from my archives, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up as a patron today at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. There you'll get access to my audio archives dating back to 2012, including one-off stories and extended episodes of my podcast, all of them ad-free. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale of terror this evening comes to us courtesy of author Max Rosa. In it, we'll meet a young man recollecting his strange experience with his school's vice principal, who has an uncanny, perhaps even otherworldly, ability to know whenever someone is up to no good. Without further ado, I present to you Mr. Peterson saw everything. During my sophomore year of high school, my family moved from urban Knoxville to a tiny one-horse town in Alabama. My dad's employer offered him a significant promotion in exchange for helping to rebuild a failing branch of their company, though their desire to save that particular sector is still a mystery to me. The area itself was dying out, as the younger generations would leave after high school in hopes of escaping the boredom of small-town life, and it was no wonder that the business was struggling to find or keep employees. However, my parents took a leap of faith and decided to relocate anyway. The town was so small that my new high school only had a graduating class of about 40 people, as I mentioned earlier, there weren't a lot of young people around, so what few teenagers existed stuck together. It was a really tight-knit school, as well as an admittedly pretty fun change of pace for a city kid like me, even though I didn't always get along with my classmates due to my awkward demeanor and out-of-date taste in clothing. I remember that we were always relatively close. Everyone knew everyone else. There weren't really any strangers in a school that small. 
In hindsight, the school was also tragically underfunded. A lot of our dances and school events were something put together entirely by students and parents, and due to budget cuts, um, we didn't really have a school nurse. Parents were just sort of encouraged to leave some pill bottles and band-aids with each homeroom teacher at the beginning of the year. Many of the teachers also taught more than one subject, or even held more than one job on campus. The Spanish teacher taught freshman literature, the art teacher was my gym instructor and basketball coach, and of course, there was Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson was our vice principal, and health teacher, and baseball coach. He was a really nice guy, always making jokes and telling funny stories about his players and the other coaches. He was more or less like everyone's good-natured uncle. I remembered that Mr. Peterson always wore those really dark mirrored sunglasses, the kind that makes it nearly impossible to see the wearer's eyes. He wore those shades everywhere, even inside, and when anyone asked about them, he would quickly explain that he had an eye condition. Can't hardly see in the light these days, he would say with a chuckle. Don't worry, though. This old man can still see enough to catch you knotheads doing wrong. And that was absolutely true. Nothing got past Mr. Peterson. He would stand in the hallways watching for students who decided to take their merry time getting to and from the cafeteria or trying to hang out in the bathrooms instead of going to class. He could see a dress code violation from a mile away, and he even seemed to know who had a hall pass and who didn't all without so much as moving from his spot in the center of the hall. Mr. Peterson saw it all. I remember one very specific encounter that I had with his uncanny sense for trouble that even now, over a half-decade later, I have no explanation for. I was in gym class, fooling around with some friends. It was Friday, our free day, so we got to choose our own activity with limited supervision. Choosing our own activity meant that we didn't have to really do anything as long as we were at least making the effort to look like we were. And limited supervision meant that, well, we sometimes got ideas. Ideas that were, in hindsight, honestly pretty bad. If we were outside, they usually involved finding a way back into the locker room without anyone noticing, or staying just a little too far from the track picked blackberries. It was a miracle that we weren't caught more than once. On this particular Friday, however, we happened to be inside. That would normally keep us in line, but it was about a week after the snack bar started selling ice cream, and the four of us were starting to get hungry. Pretending to play basketball for nearly an hour tends to do that. I don't remember who first suggested it, but at some point, we all decided it might be fun to sneak back through the back doors of the gymnasium into the hallway that passed the snack bar. We could get our ice cream and be back before our teacher even noticed our absence. I should mention that this plan was made especially risky by the fact that Mr. Peterson's office was directly across the hall from the gym. In fact, as soon as we exited the double doors... We faced the clear glass windows that our vice principal would stare out of as he worked during the day, his shaded gaze sometimes never once removing itself from the crowd of students outside. We could clearly see his desk, even from across the hallway, and his fortunately empty leather chair. There was no sign of Mr. Peterson at all. He's probably out in the field, whispered one of our friends, shrugging, Season started. The rest of us nodded in agreement, then giddily went to buy our treats. Before we even turned around, though, we heard the click of a door opening at the end of the hall and a stern shout of our last names. There stood Mr. Peterson, sweating like a dog from the heat, red-faced and panting like he'd just run all the way from the baseball field on the other side of the campus. There were no windows on the door he'd come in from, yet he seemed to know who we were and what we were up to before he even opened it. It was probably a coincidence, but the purposeful way that he burst through that door, like he knew 
that he had someone to catch in the act of rule-breaking. It was unsettling. We were, of course, pretty shaken, but Mr. Peterson let us off with a warning once we promised not to do it again. None of us ever knew much about Mr. Peterson's family, which was unusual for such a small town. We all knew that he had a son, though. Jack Peterson was a few years older than me, a really friendly guy with a broad nose and arms the size of hams. Jack was funny and bluntly honest like his dad, and he seemed to get along with just about everyone he met. He worked at the deli for the local grocery shop, and because my mom liked to send me on errands after I got home from school, I usually saw him at least once a week. The Tuesday following my run-in with Mr. Peterson was a slow day, so Jack and I ended up talking for quite a while. I remembered the incident from the Friday before and decided to bring up Jack's dad, laughing quietly as I asked him what was it like to grow up with Mr. Peterson as a parent. His face went pale. Uh, oh, uh, not, not too bad, I guess, Jack replied, small voice. I was confused by his sudden change in demeanor. What do you mean by that? Was Mr. Peterson a much different person at home than he seemed to be at school? Jack gave a slight nervous shrug. I mean, it's just... He looked me dead in the eye with the most solemn expression I'd ever seen on his normally cheery face, then said, almost fearfully, Dad sees everything. It was unsettling to see Jack so visibly uncomfortable, shaken so deeply to the core with one casual mention of his dad. I knew that there was something wrong, but Jack never brought it up again, and I sure wasn't going to. My dad's plant failed soon after that, and we ended up going back to Knoxville toward the start of my senior year, leaving the school and Mr. Peterson behind for good. About two weeks ago, I ran into Emma, one of my classmates from Alabama, while I was out buying some new plates for my apartment. It was such an odd coincidence that we would both be in the same town, in the same store even, that we were both utterly shocked. We chatted for a bit, about where we'd both gone after high school, how I was working on my law degree, and how she had moved up here for a job at an accounting firm. I asked Emma how things had been at school after I left, and she suddenly got very quiet. She told me that the day before graduation, Mr. Peterson had passed away. The whole school was devastated at the loss of their beloved vice principal, dedicating the entire commencement ceremony to his memory. There was an enormous crowd at the wake, and when she mentioned that, she got quiet. Then she told me something that I don't think I'll ever be able to fully forget. Emma told me that there were two very strange things about the wake. First, there was no sign of the Petersons, not even Jack. A lot of people were initially disappointed at not being able to finally meet the mysterious Mr. Peterson's relatives, but that disappointment gradually faded into shock at the fact that none of the dead man's family bothered to show up. Jack apparently called the school's front office to deliver the news, but after that he disappeared without a trace. He wasn't seen at the deli again. That wasn't so odd, though, as Jack was an outgoing young guy. He probably left for somewhere more interesting as soon as his last tie to the tired old town was gone. The peculiarity of the night was something that made the papers for a week afterward, something that would stick with those few who got to see it in person for a lifetime. While Mr. Peterson was all dressed up in his coffin, he still sported his signature mirrored sunglasses. Most of the attendees thought it was pretty funny, a sort of pleasant homage to the way that he never took them off while he was alive. However, Two or three of the older, stiffer townspeople stormed over to the two suit-clad morticians that were standing near the casket and demanded that the shades be removed. It's disrespectful, they hissed as their younger relatives tried unsuccessfully to keep them from making a fuss. She said that one of the morticians began to look uneasy. 
He tried to assuage the elders with the promises that this was requested by Jack himself, that Mr. Peterson surely would have wanted the glasses to be left alone, that it wasn't their place to question the family's wishes, but they weren't having any of it. The man looked helplessly at his colleague, who then nervously patted at the brow with his handkerchief and went to remove the shades. The whole room waited in silent anticipation. She described the atmosphere as so still, so quiet, that the sound of their own heartbeat pulsating in her chest seemed blaringly loud in comparison. That was because everyone in the room, students, teachers, neighbors, churchgoers, store owners, realized they had never seen Mr. Peterson's eyes. Not a single person in the twenty or so years that he'd lived in town had ever once seen him without his mirrored sunglasses. The odd silence was broken by an ear-piercing scream. Miss Becky from the cake shop had been standing near the front when the shades were first pulled before she leapt at least two feet away from the coffin in shock. This began a chain reaction of confusion and panic as more and more people went to see what had startled her so badly only to get spooked themselves. A few of the women all but pulled their husbands out of the funeral home while several teenagers whispered to each other anxiously about what they had seen. The feed store owner, Mr. Walker, stared at the corpse with wide eyes, crying, Dear Lord, his face! Emma had been near the back when all of this first happened, so it took her a while to get to the front. When she did, however, it became devastatingly clear what Mr. Walker had been yelling about. Her face paled a bit when she described the sight to me. It was just skin, like, like somebody had stretched it all the way up. Like those people who have surgery after their faces get blown up or something, Emma explained. Only it, it wasn't that. The skin just kept going like it was always there, no dents or bumps, no scars, nothing. Not even cheekbones, none that we could see. It was just smooth like the side of your cheek. Just smooth, all the way up. I thanked Emma for her time and told her that it was nice seeing her again, that we would have to meet up for lunch sometime, but that I really had to get going if I was going to finish running errands before it got dark. That part wasn't exactly true. I'd already done everything on my to-do list and was in no hurry to get home. But that story chilled me more than I wanted to let on. I really didn't want to believe it. And if this were anyone other than gentle, soft-spoken, honor student Emma, I wouldn't have. Or at least, not if the story had been about anybody else. I remembered my encounter with Mr. Peterson that one fateful day when I should have been in gym, and that knowing way he opened that door, shouting our names out before he'd even had time to see us. We had all agreed that he must have installed a camera in his office and was watching us from a laptop or something out on the baseball field. But if that was true, how did he make it all the way from the other side of the school in a few seconds that we were out in the hallway? It just didn't add up. If Emma was to be believed, though, we can still definitely be sure of something. Mr. Peterson had no eyes, but he still saw everything. I hope you enjoyed Mr. Peterson Saw Everything by Max Rosa, uh, performed by yours truly. Up next, we've got one final round of frightening fiction for you. From author L. Chan comes a tale about a doting father excited to move out of the suburbs and into a new home in a quieter area that is until he's unsettled by strange sounds coming from inside the walls. Without further ado, I present to you The House with Painted Doors. The doctor told me it was a figment of my imagination, a hallucination, a phantom limb, cut off, but the ghost of a feeling remains. 
The doctor tooted and prescribed me a different pill. I've lost count of how many pills I've tried. There was the yellow one, and the red and white capsule, and the green one. They have succeeded in giving me incontinence, nausea, and hair loss. But they haven't taken away my girl. My doctor told me to talk about it. Tell people. Who the hell am I supposed to tell something like this? My last friends abandoned me when Sylvia left. It's late here. It's just me and no sleep. Where to start? Oh, where there's so much to tell. At the beginning, I suppose, it's always a good place. We thought we had it made when we moved into the suburbs. We had well-paying jobs. Fluke or competence had saved us when the waves of cuts hit around 2010. For once in our lives, money wasn't a problem. Eight years earlier, we had Annabelle. Belle for short. She was our little angel. Parents out there will know. A child shifts the center of gravity of your life. The move was good for her. Good for us, away from the bustle and hustle and danger of the city. Busy streets, missing children, the sticky hands, and staring eyes of sexual predators. It wasn't the house of our dreams, but it was close enough. A lawn for the balmy summer months, fireplace for the chill of winter, space for us to grow into, especially for a young girl. It came fully furnished, and it was a steal. A distressed sale, our agent called it. At least a tenth off with a similar property would set us back. The euphoria and novelty lasted me till the first night. Sylvia was asleep next to me. The moonlight sparkled off the fine hairs of her bare shoulder. We shared a celebratory drink after dinner, and then after that, another. And I was lying in bed, basking in the warm glow of alcohol, when I first heard it. My first thought was rats. That was exactly what it sounded like. The little tap dance of tiny claws on hardwood coming from the walls. The delicate snoring from next to me told me that Sylvia was undisturbed by the scratching noise coming from the walls. I flinched as my bare feet touched the cold floor. The floorboards groaned in protest as I padded across the room like an overweight ninja. The tapping paused at the first creak of the floorboards, then resumed. The rough weave of the wallpaper under my palm as I leaned in to track the pitter-patter behind the walls. Scampering sounds eluded me. Every time I attempted to track the rats, the sounds seemed to come from another part of the room. My knees grew sore from pressure. I wasn't some young child at a playground. I was a grown man, and my weight pressed down on the bony points of my kneecaps. Out of desperation, I put my ear to the wall, hoping that the source of the little noises would reveal itself to me. I was only met with a stubborn silence, or almost a stubborn silence. On the edge of my hearing, so quiet that I had to strain my ears to pick it up, a child's laughter from inside the walls. I did not speak of the incident. I spent more time trying to convince myself that there hadn't been that childish giggle. Wind, perhaps, and the rattle of a toy. Not a rattle, maybe one of those newfangled dolls with those soulless eyes and microchip voice. There was a change in her, like the heavy air you can smell before a thunderstorm. She was a little quieter than usual. A strange environment will do that to a kid, a little withdrawn. Sylvia didn't really notice. I suppose I'd always been more observant than her. Belle started looking tired, dark crescents appearing under her light hazel eyes. She wasn't getting much sleep. My first instinct was to blame the rats in the walls. Who wouldn't? They got louder and louder as the days went by. The damn things were keeping me up at night. It seemed that the sounds progressed from simple scratchings to thumps, almost as though the cursed rodents were hurling themselves bodily against my walls. The thumping started sounding eerily like footsteps. I was not about to be defeated by a group of jumped-up rats in my own house. Fueled by testosterone-induced rage, I waged war. 
I tried glue traps. I tried poison. I tried cages. Nothing worked. I asked Sylvia about it, but she seemed oblivious to the late-night disturbances. That woman could sleep through a hurricane. I asked Bill if the noise was keeping her up at night. Sylvia was over in the living room, watching TV, while Bell and I did the dishes. She just looked up with those big eyes of hers. The other children want to come in and play, but they can't open the door. The girl always had an overactive imagination, but this one hit a little too close to home for me. I felt the unfamiliar prickle of goose flesh on my arm. You mean the door to the house, I asked keeping my tone deliberately playful. It was a game, just another of her little games. I had imaginary friends at that age. Why should my own child have been any different? No, Daddy. The door behind the cupboard. The opening theme from Desperate Housewives floated up through the floorboards a world away. I thought I'd humor my little girl, but there was something deathly serious in her tone that I could not shake. I reached back around the standalone wardrobe and felt nothing more than the smooth paint on the wall. There's no door there, honey. Look closer, she insisted. I held up my cell phone for light, still playing along. There was something strange in that palm width of space between the cupboard and the wall. A discoloration of the wall, perhaps something darker in the shade of the wardrobe. The hard edges of the wardrobe bit into the soft flush of my fingers. I put my back into it, and the piece of furniture gave ground grudgingly. And there it was. A door behind the wardrobe, just as Belle had said. Not any door, though. I ran my fingers over the smooth surface of a wall. Just a painted one. So convincing were the brush strokes on the door that I had to touch the wall again to tell myself that it wasn't real. How'd you know this was here, baby bear? I asked. The other children told me. From school. As far as I knew, she hadn't brought friends home before. No, Daddy, the children from behind the door, she said. I looked into her tawny eyes, hoping to spot some twinkle of mischief there. There was nothing there but an innocent earnestness. I lay in bed that night, studying the cracks in the ceiling. My heart pounded hard in my chest, a heavy bass line above the distant rumble of the heating. My daughter's words had unsettled me in a strange way I could not pinpoint. It felt off somehow, like a surrealist painting, one tiny detail throwing my carefully ordered world into disarray. I took no deep breaths trying to drive away that strange, tight fear in my chest. The odd painted door, a mural of some sort? Why was it still there when the room had been so clearly repainted? The thumping of the rats in the walls sounding so much like little footsteps. The children from behind the door, she said. I rubbed at my forearms vigorously, trying to press the goosebumps back down into my skin. That's when the thumping started again. Not rats, I realized. Not rats at all. Footsteps. The light bounce of a child. I crept up to my wall again, pressing my ear against the wallpaper. There was laughter there, faint and soft. Not the laughter of a single child. Children. Their happy footfalls beating a rough drumbeat on the wooden floor. There was someone else in there with my daughter. My heart jumped. I felt the chill in my veins as I rushed out of my room and tore down the corridor. The silvery light of the moon shone through the window. It gave everything an odd, flat look without contrast. Belle's room was only a few feet from the door to our bedroom, but my chest heaved with deep, body-shaking breaths. I could still hear them faintly through the door, the thud of their feet on the floor. I steeled myself. There was nothing. Sound traveled strangely through these old houses. Echoes, maybe. She was just talking to herself in her sleep, the stress of moving, perhaps. Suitably calmed, I turned the doorknob slowly. There was a conspiratorial shush from the other side of the door, and silence descended like a shroud. I gave the door a gentle push. The room was dark and quiet. The moonlight crept into the room. My daughter was standing there, just behind the door, a still figure against a dark background. 
The shock took the strength from my legs. I backed away a little quicker than I meant to. She stood there, swaying slightly. Thin white crescents showed from under her hooded eyelids. Her lips were moving almost soundlessly. I leaned forward, straining to make out what she was saying. It slowly became clear, one sentence over and over. All of the doors are open now. All the doors are open. And from behind her, in the shadowed room, the quiet click of a door shutting. Belle didn't recall a thing the next morning. She could sense my frustration and fear as I quizzed her about the night before. Dark circles framed puzzled eyes in her pale face. She hadn't slept well that night either. Sylvia took her to school. I hadn't broached the topic with Sylvia yet. There was still some time before I had to leave for the office. I crept back into my daughter's room, feeling like a thief in my own empty house. I stood there in front of that strange painted door for the second time in as many days. I ran my fingers around its edges, remembering the strange sound of the door shutting from the night before. Its edges were wholly contiguous with the wall. I pulled the wardrobe out further, putting my entire frame between the wardrobe and the door and leaning into it. There was no give, no yielding of the door. It was just painted over a wall as solid as any other. I was about to go when I heard an unfamiliar rasp under my foot. The floor was gritty with some kind of dust. I knelt down and pinched some of the dust up between two fingers. All the doors are open now. My daughter's dreamy voice in my ear, my memory of it so sharp that it seemed that she was right there whispering it. How odd it was for the dust to be pink. Of course it would be. It wasn't dust at all. It was paint. Paint from the wall. Things didn't get better. The gambling footsteps continued at night unabated. That and the whispers and the giggles at night. Whatever was in my daughter's room toyed with me. It never let Sylvia hear it. I'd stay up, waiting to wake my wife up just in time to hear it, only to be met with a stubborn silence. Trickery wouldn't work either. We stayed up late to catch a DVD long into the small hours of the night, but the house remained quiet. The laughter from the next room was always tantalizingly distant. The happy sounds of children at play, as though from a great distance. Too great a distance to be in the room next to mine. Belle was in high spirits, but she was wasting away. Sylvia hadn't noticed it yet, but I felt it in the sharp bones of her shoulders, pressing into my arms when I hugged her. Or her skinny arms that I could almost encircle with my thumb and forefinger. I received an email from her teacher, mentioning that Belle still wasn't integrating well at school. He said that Belle was perpetually tired in class, and she had blamed late-night games of tag and hide-and-seek with her friends for her tiredness. You need to exercise more control over your girl, he said. I had to know what was going on. Sylvia was already asleep. The nightly visits hadn't started yet. I slid into Belle's room silently, an open packet of flour in my hand. I scattered it all around the floor, taking care not to step into the flour myself. I lay back in my bed with a sigh, waiting for the sounds to start. Sleep took me unexpectedly, but what little I had was fitful and restless. I woke with a snort at first light. It was Saturday, and it would be some time yet before the rest of the world woke. I stretched under the covers, my back popping satisfyingly. I blinked the sleep from my eyes. The flower. I had to check the flower. I swung my feet off the bed and planted them on the floor right next to a pair of white speckled footprints, just where they would be if someone was standing over my bed, staring at me. That damnable chill stole the warmth of the morning sun from my skin. My hands clenched and unclenched spastically like dying spiders. I stared at the trail of flower-marked footprints from my open door. How long had she stood there in the dark watching me sleep, I wondered. I stood up on shaky legs, my hand on the wall to support myself down the corridor. Bell's door was ajar and swung open silently. The sound of deep breathing told me that Bell was still asleep. 
there was but a single set of footprints just starting from her bed, where her feet would have landed if she got off. No multiple footprints, just a single set for my daughter. Typical somnambulism, perhaps. The stress of the move, the new school, could have brought it on. She'd never sleepwalked before, but who knew what dark things lurked in her psyche. I heaved a sigh of relief, chastising myself for a week's worth of irrationality. How reassuring the illusion of normalcy in our lives, and how quickly it shatters. Not with a roar or a flash, with something simple. Something simple, like my daughter's shoe bouncing off my toe as I tried to leave the room. Flipping once, twice, and coming to rest to a hollow in the flower on the floor. The size, the shoe, the prints. It didn't fit. It didn't match. Whatever had gotten off the bed had stood next to me the night before. It wasn't Bell. After that cruel prank, the noises at night returned unabated. The strangeness started to leak. The night was no longer its sole province. I was waiting for Bell outside the upstairs toilet another Saturday morning when I heard the familiar taunting voices start up over the sound of the shower. A chorus of children's voices saying something with a strange cadence, a chant almost. Stay. They seemed to say, stay, stay, stay. They were in there. There was no way for them to escape. I found the door unlocked. I turned the knob, braced my legs, and threw the door open and found nothing. Hot water still gushed from the shower head. Steam billowed out into the cooler air of the corridor. No one was there. I'd seen her go in. I would have wagered my life on it. And yet she was gone. The giggling started again coming down the corridor, mocking. Her room. I bolted down the corridor. I found her there, a towel wrapped around her bare body, staring at me with a cold mirth from her bed. Her dripping hair had left a trail of water on the wooden floor, a trail which led to the wall with the painted door. I felt her eyes trailing me as I left the room. I shut the shower off, looking for how my daughter and the voices had escaped the tiny toilet. It took a minute. Like the picture with the young lady that turned into an old crone, the answer was right there in front of me, Sketched out between the towels in front of me, in bold strokes of dark mildew, was the vague outline of a door. It was another sleepless night. I thought long and hard about trying to explain everything to Sylvia. It sounded crazy. There were doors in the walls. Doors that our daughter had walked through. Doors let in something strange into our house. Something that wanted her to stay. The thought lingered in the back of my head like a superlative scab, itchy and red and raw. Sleep would not come easy. I was contemplating a little chemical assistance to aid me along my way when I grew aware of a soft sliding sound. Movement caught my eye. I saw a slim figure slowly shuffle by the door to our bedroom. Belle, I called out to her softly. She didn't break step. And what a step it was, a stiff-armed and stiff-legged march down the corridor, her feet scraping over the wooden floor. Bell, I called out, a little louder. There was no response. I got out of bed and tiptoed to the door. The door to the toilet clicked shut softly. I followed. The lights revealed an empty corridor. The toilet door yielded a squeak of complaint. The silence was thick and cloying. It seemed that no sound would carry through the air. The light clicked to life in the toilet. Shadows leapt and danced with its first few flickers. The shower curtain swayed. The draft I had let in when I opened the door, I told myself. It did not help. I chided myself for my childish fears, but the flutter in my gut remained. I yanked the curtain aside roughly. My other hand balled into a fist to protect myself. From what? My daughter? Nothing awaited me on the other side of the curtain. Nothing but that strange outline of a door etched out in lines with tiles. I heaved a sigh of relief. Perhaps the lack of sleep was getting me. My fear spilling into waking dreams. The calm was short-lived. I heard another door slam shut. Downstairs. 
A series of childish titters carried up through the floorboards. I bolted downstairs. Again, the lights revealed nothing, almost nothing. The huge throw rug that had come with the furnished house had been tossed aside. There, hidden under it, was another door scratched into the parquet flooring. I felt sick to my stomach thinking of the days we spent on the couch with our feet on that hideous thing. I ran my fingers around the grooves of the thin grooves of the scratch marks. The door felt cool to the touch, cooler than the surrounding wood. The same feel of a front door guarding against the winter chill. Whatever it was that the door guarded against, it was cold, very cold. The laughter started again, taunting, mocking. I heard the creak of my daughter's footsteps on the stairs to the basement. The light of the living room seemed to shy away from the depths of the basement. I could make out Belle's outline just where the light of the living room met the darkness of the basement. The light switch was at the foot of the stairs. The steps sagged under my weight. Belle didn't turn around. I reached out to grab her shoulder. Her bony shoulder was icy cold. I pulled her towards me. I could just nearly see her face. Something blotted out the light. I blinked at the silhouette at the top of the staircase. Daddy, why are all the lights on? Belle's voice. Oh, God. Belle was at the top of the stairs. I felt the light caress of fingers on my hand, the girl in front of me, her fingers on mine. Her voice was a hoarse whisper, as though forced from a throat long turned to dust. She's ours now, she giggled and twisted away from my grasp, vanishing into the dark. The dark space under the house suddenly filled with a patter of feet on the dusty floor, two pairs, three pairs, until it seemed that an entire legion of light feet were dancing across the floor. The sound was deafening in that confined space. I reached forward and thumbed a light switch, only to be greeted by silence and the slowly settling dust. Something was wrong with the wall again. I already knew what to expect. With a sweep of my hand, I cleared the dust from the wall, just as I expected another door. This one, a huge set of double doors, painted on the wall with garish colors. Just before I left the basement, I saw the clean circles on the floor where the opening had just swept the dust away. We had to go. There was something dark in the house, something wholly unnatural about those strange painted doors. I sprinted up the stairs. Grab some clothes, I told Belle as I passed her. I did not stop to see if there was a shred of understanding in her black eyes. She turned and followed me silently upstairs. I shook Sylvia awake roughly. Four weeks to the day we moved in and we were fleeing our own home. She blinked asleep from her eyes. In hushed tones, I tried to explain the situation to her. The painted doors, the sound of children, the danger we were all in. Her expression slowly changed from sleepy bewilderment to one of disbelief and annoyance. She told me that I was overreacting and that the stress of the move and our job was taking its toll on me. We would talk about it in the morning, she said. Get help from a doctor if we needed to. I grew increasingly agitated at her apathy. I begged her to humor me for just one night, for our family to shift to a motel for a single evening. Our conversation grew heated. All this was cut short when Belle reappeared at our doorway. Her hair was wild, her eyes burning with some inner fire. You should go now. All the doors are closing soon. I must stay with them. Her voice was toneless, the flat delivery of an atheist reciting a litany. Sylvia gaped. Having her daughter acting as strangely as her husband tipped her over the edge. Weeping, she rushed forward and held Belle close to her. You're not going anywhere. This isn't real. Daddy's sick. He's made you sick, too. You and I will get away from here. Get away from Daddy. Those words felt like physical blows. I felt sick. My wife started pulling at Belle's hand, trying to move her. Belle stood fast, and there was nothing my wife, with her advantages and strength and weight, could do to shift her an inch. Sensing their prey about to invade them, the things in the house grew restless. Our rooms filled with the sound of feet on the floor, the sound of little feet running up and down the corridors. With a squeak, Sylvia pulled the door shut and leaned against it. 
The door shuddered on its hinges as unseen things flung themselves against it. Unsuccessful, the house grew silent. Sylvia stared at the doorknob. I shook my head, stepping off the bed. I had just gotten onto my feet when a new horror showed itself. Our wall was stretching, distending like a boil, bulging obscenely toward us. There was a door in our room, under the wallpaper. It had been there all along. Sylvia began to sob, big, hiccuping sobs of fear. We heard the tearing sound of the glue ripping off the walls. The blister of the wall took shape. I saw the hard edge of the door pressing, straining against the wallpaper. And behind that, the sharp points of fingers pressing against outwards. Many, many pairs of hands, and then a rip. A pale finger burst through the thick wallpaper. It hooked downwards and began to tear at the fabric. Sylvia and I were transformed by the sight, paralyzed by fear. Sylvia screamed as Belle tore herself free from her mother's grasp. Belle took another step forward and placed her hand on the light switch. In that moment, I saw my daughter again. For the last time, her eyes sparkled with tears. Don't look. You don't want to see them. I love you. With a flick of her wrist, she plunged the room into total darkness. The sound of the wallpaper ripping was very loud. The temperature in the room fell. It felt larger somehow, that we weren't in the bedroom of our home anymore, but in some vast and empty space. A chill wind blew, and it smelt of dry dust. When the wind died down, we were alone in our room. Our girl was gone. What is there left to say after that? We did what we could. We moved into a motel. The police came. They looked for prints. They asked questions. They took pictures. They broke down the walls behind the doors with their hammers. Nothing. The detectives came. They asked more questions. Hard questions, sometimes. They took me away for a while. The doctors came. They cajoled and counseled. They asked me about my parents, about our family if I had ever hurt my daughter. The doctors found nothing wrong with me. The cops found nothing in my house. The detectives found nothing false in our story. They let me go. Sylvia and I stayed with her parents for a month. Belle's disappearance ripped a hole in our lives. We tried. Some things just don't heal, right? Other things don't heal at all. Things just weren't the same. The split was amicable. We just drifted. No arguments, no fights. Just a slow death of the love that had once bound us. And what then? I came back here. There was nowhere else I could go. The first night was the hardest. The bedroom was out of the question. I spent the first night on the couch, hugging a bottle of Jack. It was midnight when the laughter woke me. They were still there in the house. Through the tinkling of the laughter, I could pick out just one single voice. A father never forgets the voice of his child. The doors were gone, but they were still there. She was still there. I'll stop here for the night. I can hear her again. She sounds... happy. I hope you enjoyed The House with Painted Doors by L. Chan and performed by yours truly. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this bonus episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark, part of a new series in which I share a handful of the creepy tales from my extensive audio archive with you each and every Wednesday. If you enjoyed what you've heard, please... Take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear more content from my archive, as well as premium extended editions of my regular episodes featuring Twice the Terror, 
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can also subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next time, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>